Palisade Radio is brought to you by First Majestic Silver Corp., one of the world's purest and fastest growing silver mining companies. Welcome everyone to another episode of Palisade Radio. This is your host, Colin Cattell. On the line with us today is a new guest to the program. His name is Gren Thomas. Gren is the CEO of West Haven, which is a gold exploration company. And a lot of people might know his name. He's very, very successful uh, in the speculation and mining business uh, throughout his life. Gren, welcome to the program. Well, thanks for the invitation, uh, Con. Yeah, there's a great piece that the Vancouver Sun put together, which I've used partially as a basis for this interview. Uh, it talks about your early years, and, and really from the beginning, uh, it seems that, that you were born into mining and always had an interest. You talked about uh, the adventures of, of Biggles, if I'm not mistaken, a cartoon uh, where Biggles flies all over South America in search of treasure, and that, that really lit something up inside of you at a young age. Can you share your, your early year stories as it relates to mining? Yeah, well, I, I grew up in, um, in South Wales, as, uh, as some people know. And into a heavy industrial area, you know, with coal mines, steelworks, and and all refineries and uh, armaments factories and the like. And um, and uh, early on in school, I started to read books, you know, as kids do, of various adventure stories. And one of them concerned a, a pilot, uh, you know, bush pilot, and some prospectors in South America. So I always had in the back of my mind the idea that sometime I would leave this um, rather industrialized area and, and head out uh, to for, for the parts of the world, you know. And um, however, before doing that, I became involved in the coal mining industry um, when I was quite young. I, I started to work underground in coal mine when I was 16. Um, in the area I was in, of course, there weren't a great deal of uh, choices as to what you did. And uh, mining was one of the main ones. Uh, Many of the people in, in the area I lived were coal miners. Most of them were steel workers, but um, coal mining was uh, doing very well. And I, and ever since I started work on the ground, I was 16, which is 1957. I've always enjoyed mining, you know, despite people saying it must have been grim. It was actually pretty interesting for uh, to me as a young person, and that's how I made my entrance into. Uh, into mining, and I finally left there and went to, you know, Garena Pastures in Canada and got into the mining business there and subsequently into the prospecting uh, business. Yeah, so at that point when you transitioned from being a miner yourself to uh, prospecting, uh, where where was your head at in deciding to take that le leap? That's obviously where a lot of the major players in mining today made their money either prospecting themselves or supporting people like yourselves who uh, picked up assets and ended up finding a major discovery on them. Well, that's what happens, of course, as you progress through a career. I ended up eventually going to college part-time when I was working in a coal mine and eventually went to university and got a degree in mining engineering. And when I came to Canada, then it was as a mining engineer to work in the nickel mines in Sudbury. I subsequently got transferred from there to a gold mine in, in the Northwest Territories, Yellowknife. And um, whilst working there, of course, I mixed a lot with people that were um, uh, in the exploration business because it was a frontier town. There was a lot of exploration going on, going on out of there. And I was offered a position uh, to work as a geologist. Um, uh, on a drill um, when I was about 25 years old and of course after that I I, I st stuck really with mining after that and, and uh, with exploration and left uh, the, um, the mining business itself and became an exploration uh, person and um, it was because of the mix mixing with all these people, you know, the bush palace, the prospectors, the geologists, the, the exploration departments and the mines, and, and it was the kind of life that I guess I dreamed about when I was a child. Excellent. Well, let's go through some of the uh, successes that you had in the past. Uh, I, I think I have the chronology here correct, but uh, if I'm wrong, please do correct me. The, the, the first major asset that you prospected and picked up was uh, a rare earth deposit in the Yellowknife uh, Yellowknife area that's now uh, today being held by Avalon. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, and um, 
that came about because uh, you know various metals uh, are in vogue at certain times depending on the prices and demand and what have you and back in the the 70s there was a lot of um, um, exploration going on for uranium because uranium was thought to be in short supply and uh, there had been big discoveries made in Saskatchewan and uh, a lot of money had been made in the market so a lot of people were looking for uh, you know uranium and one of the um, we were a bit led into the game because we were looking for lead zinc in um, another part of the country in Yukon actually and um, when a, a fellow uh, geologist and I decided we, we would go out and uh, look for uranium back in the shield in the Yellowknife area and we zeroed in on a deposit uh, at the time was called the um, Odin deposit and and it was a radioactive occurrence, um, but unfortunately, after a year or so's work, we realized that it, it was not the type of geology you expected to find really significant uranium deposits. And although there was plenty of radi radioactivity, it was largely thorium, but there were um, a lot of strange uh, mixture of, uh, of metals there, including the rare earths, uh, beryllium, you know, columbium, uh, tantalum, uh, in this uh, this alkali complex, which uh, took some years to recognize, but eventually it became quite a well-known uh, deposit because it ended up being, of course, millions and millions of tons of um, of, of uh, a number of metals. The the one which has turned out to be the most significant development of late, of course, has been the, the rare earth um, minerals um, and. Um, being developed by Avalon Minerals. At the time, we 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 had the project, and we had it for probably 15 years, and spent a lot of money there. We um, we had focused on originally on the tantalum and Colombian, and latterly on the beryllium. And of course, it's a it's a very significant beryllium deposit, which many people don't um, don't realize that when you read the Avalon literature because they don't really talk about it much there because their focus is the rare earths and that discovery we made in 1974 and we we worked on it for many years and I um, uh, you know lived out there for a long time working on that project and uh, it's a very exciting project and it's got a lot of potential and I'm sure that one day it'll be a very large um, mine and a source of of these um, very important metals for a long time. Well, and then what an outsider might call, and maybe yourself, the, the highlight uh, of, of your career was the discovery of diamonds in Canada. And uh, you were instru you've been instrumental in the diamond industry in Canada. It's now, I believe, the, the third largest producer of diamonds by value uh, worldwide. And, and part of that is uh, due in part to discovery that you made. Can you can you give us the uh, suspenseful story around your discovery of diamonds in Canada? Yes, well, it's true that the the Canadian diamond business has become a significant uh, element in in the business in Canada, and um, we're producing now well over a billion dollars worth of diamonds per annum, and um, most of which come from the Lac de Grey area. Now, the credit to the discovery of the area in general has to go to Chuck Fipke and Stu Blesson, who were two pioneering geologist prospectors who made the initial discoveries in that area in in, uh, in, the, late, in the early 90s, in the late 80s, early 90s. And in the, the fall of 91, um, they became obliged to say something about the discoveries that they'd made there. And this, of, of course, intrigued, you know, the, the exploration uh, fraternity in Canada because it was something that people had never seriously that, that many people had never seriously uh, considered as being possible in Canada although at the, at the time a small number of people did realize this was probably um, going to be a, a diamond country one day the mass of people were just not familiar enough with diamonds to think that way so it was all thought to be a bit um, um, mysterious or spurious even. However, they did publish some information in, in the, the fall of, of 91, 
which people started to then take seriously and start asking, well, what does this mean? They've discovered micro diamonds in a uh, kimberlite at this location. Um, what is the significance of this? So it, it takes a while for people to phone around people and phone people in South Africa or at the Bears or anything, or anything about mines to determine, well, how important is this? So we as a group at the time were working in, um, in Greenland and Iceland with uh, two companies called um, um, Platmover and um, another one called West Viking. And we um, lo- lo- considered what we were doing there and decided it, m- it might be uh, things weren't looking that well, the metals we were looking for, so we thought, well, let's turn our right eye towards this diamond plane. Let's see if we can acquire an interest in the area. So we went up and acquired land where we thought might, which I, we thought might be prospective to make further discoveries in proximity to the uh, properties that at that time was staked by Diamet, which was the, the company that Stu Blossom and Chuck Fipke had begun. And we were guided by a, a fellow by the name of Dr. Jennings, Chris Jennings, who had worked with us peripherally on other metals, but also knew a lot about diamonds being South African and having worked with diamonds. So he became involved with us and helped us to you know, locate where we should do the ground and this sort of thing. And it was all done in a very secretive way because I think we became aware of the fact that this was a fairly significant development for Canada, uh, largely because of Jennings had persuaded us that this was the case. And um, so we thought, well, if we go in here and quiet ground, we build it very quietly without making a fuss about it. And before we think this huge staking ground will we'll start. And of course, so the result was we got in there very early after the announcement was made and acquired some very good ground. And subsequently, um, this ground that we acquired uh, turns out to be uh, to contain the, the riches of those pipes uh, in that area. In fact, it's the rich, one of the richest pipes in the world. And that was the Divic uh, deposit A154 South and A154 North, and um, which are coming to the end of their lives now. They've been in production for quite a while. Yes, it was a very exciting time, and uh, of course I was closely involved with my, my daughter on that project as well. And um, and we also had a, a you know a JV with with uh, what is now Rio Tinto um, as our partner. It was a very exciting time. Well, since you since you brought your daughter up, it's uh, it's probably. Uh, a good point to to bring that up. Not only was your family from before you uh, involved in the mining space, and you've gone through several commodities yourself, iron and and coal and nickel, uh, rare earths, diamonds. Uh, Your daughter actually has taken a very strong liking from a young age to mining, and and she's now uh, a bit of a mining magnet herself. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, well, of course, uh, she cut her teeth again at Thor Lake, you know, on the rare earth deposit when she was up there when she was in her, in her early teens or even not in her teens and uh, spending time at the camp. And uh, the camp was uh, was a very home, homely sort of place. It, um, it had some good geologists and drillers working there. And, of course, the, the children, it was a nice place for children to spend a summer. And, of course, she was quite workish, even at a young age, and she, we had her doing jobs in the bush uh, when she was 13, 14 years old, you know, and uh, doing jet physics and, <laughs> and sampling and that sort of stuff. So she grew up around it, knowing what it was about, and um, so it was a natural thing for her to want to do, to, was to do that in, in university when she went there. And she was also exposed to... Um, some uh, female geologists who were working there at that deposit at the time, which was somewhat unusual in those days to have many, you know, female geologists around. Like, like in, in then say ten years before this, practically unknown. So, so that was the time things were were starting to change a lot. So, um, 
so I think probably when she went off to university, she was probably one of the few uh, women doing geology in those days. So she had a good grounding in it, and she knew that she would like doing it, and that's how she really got involved in geology. And after that, of course, she she did her own thing a lot and has ended up um, being involved in a lot of different mining uh, projects and oil companies even, and, uh, and um, is uh, now in gold in a significant way. Excellent. Well, I, w- I want to fast forward to today. Uh, you've you've shifted gears yet again, and well, I'm sure you've uh, had plenty to retire on several times. Uh, you know, your passion for the game continues, and you're now working on a company by the name of West Haven Ventures, uh, which is exploring for for gold in British Columbia. What can you tell us about West Haven? Well, West Haven is um, you know a company that is really started by me and my son some years ago. He was my youngest child, and uh, he's the other one of my children in the mining business. And he, has again, got involved in mining from a relatively young age, working up around uh, the Loch de Grairie in, in Diamonds and when he was about 14 or 15, 16 years old. And we decided we'd start this company some years ago, which were, the timing was terrible, of course, because as the mining business was starting to to go downhill for what what has been a, quite, a, quite a number of years. Um, however, um, he likes BC a lot, and um, he uh, and we decided we would we could do an initial initial projects in um, in British Columbia and in gold, in particular. And we, I and, and he both are liking to a, an area called the Spencer's Bridge Gold Belt which is a gold area, particularly as close to Vancouver. It's a two and a half hour drive from my house to one of the properties, which is on uh, a major highway. I can go from two hours from my house to the drill and go through one stop sign. And, and most of that driving is on the, on a, the Trans-Canada Highway, which is a major you know, uh, motorway. And uh, also on the Coquihalla Highway, these are very um, fast, you know, modern roads. And we decided we'd take this on this property called the Shovel Nose. And we made a deal with my old company to buy it off them because they were working on a nickel play by now. This was a company called uh, Strongbow. And so we took that as our, one of our first projects um, to work on. And, of course, we've um, worked on that area now for, um, for some years. The, the history of the area is what intrigued me a lot and, and got me interested in this area. This was the site of the first gold rush in Canada in the, in the 1850s, and it was called the Fraser River, and it was called the Fraser River Gold Rush. And this was a gold rush which was started really by people from California, the 49ers who were coming up from California along the west coast, who made the discovery of gold on the Fraser River in, in the 1850. And throughout that time, a lot of gold was mined out of there, and eventually the, the rush petered out, and then they moved up to a place called Parkerville, which is further in, up in the interior, and there was a major gold rush there. Then there was a third one, a major one in the Klondike, which was uh, by now the 1890s. And um, they still had not found a source of gold back on the Fraser River, you know. Until in 19, in 2000, early 2000s, a company went in there called Almaden, who made some gold discoveries, a fellow by the name of, of Ed Ballon. And they held property in there, which we optioned, subsequently, a company they also ran, optioned some of their ground, and drilled the first diamond drill hole in that whole belt, which is 150 kilometers long. There had never been a drill hole in there since the 1850, and this is now 2005. And that first hole ran 12 meters of 20 grams gold, which is a significant intersection. The company subsequently couldn't really increase the tonnage or find many new things in there. However, we did succeed in identifying this belt as an important epithermal district to my mind and um, we've subsequently pushed uh, picked away at it we've acquired more land and we now have about 30,000 hectares in the area 
and we have um, a tonnage block out in one piece, and we have another area where we have some interesting intersections. But this is just the start of what I think could be a, a significant new discovery in this area. The, 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 the drilling has been done, has been very small scale, but all the indications are that we can find a significant discovery of here. And um, that's what's taking my interest right now is um, is this, uh, these two properties, the shovel nose and the PV property. And um, we've been patient about acquiring land there and doing uh, small amounts of work because there have never been significant amounts of money around till now because the gold price has been been wavering a little bit and um, the mining business has been tough to finance. But I think now our day is coming here. And uh, we are planning to go in there and do a, a drill program in the fall, a smaller one in, in June, but a large one in uh, the fall. And um, I'm hoping that we'll see some, some, some significant results come out of there. We, um, in the drilling in the past, as you know, they've had intersections like 0.74 grams over 96 meters, um, you know, 12 grams over one, one and a half meters, you know, 22 grams over a meter, this sort of thing. There's a lot of smoke, and it's, we are very high in what is a typical epithermal system. And what really is required is to drill to depths where we have identified beautiful epithermal textures. We're getting the gold in, in, in a number of places. The zones are quite large. So I'm very hopeful that we're going to see some significant results come out of there this year. Well, thanks for that. Just for our listeners, uh, once, once again, the company name is West Haven Ventures, which trades as WHN on the Venture Exchange. Uh, I just want to f- finish off with one last question. You're obviously serially successful in your ventures in the in this uh, prospecting business, uh, finding substantial deposits that have turned into mines. Uh, as you just alluded to, the cycle seems to be changing, and uh, anytime you're you're working on a project, you are at the mercy of how much money is is given to you by the market. Hopefully, that's picking up now, but. I want to ask you what what you think uh, investors in the in the resource space can expect over the next few years based on what you've seen in your lifetime. Well, I think what's going to happen uh, soon is that somebody will make um, a brand new discovery, possibly like us. <laughs> and because a lot of what's happening in the mining business the last few years has been the development of really existing discoveries. You know, people have either. Um, had these deposits and they've got in there, they've increased the tonnage and they brought them into production and it's all been um, it's all been solid work but it hasn't we haven't had a discovery out there, a brand new discovery recently that has set the market alight you know, which is what we need right now and I'm, I'm sure this is going to happen sometime soon and uh, like a Hemlo or, or um, you know a Stikine or these various discoveries that have been made that have set off Rushes, or like the diamond rush um, back in the in the in the early 90s, it was it was a new discovery of some kind, and um, or the uranium discoveries in Saskatchewan, you know, the things that are brand new, and I'm I'm sure this is about to happen somewhere in Canada, and then that will bring more money back into the exploration scene because people get optimistic again, and they will all start to start to make money, which they are doing now in some of the uranium stocks, some of the lithium stocks and uh, certainly some of the gold stocks. Um, you know, my daughter's company, Kamenak, has gone from 60 cents a year to you know, so dollar fifty, and it's, it's going to, there's a mine there. But that's not a brand new discovery. That discovery was made 10 years ago. But um, people will start to realize there is still money to be made in the mining business and um, that some of these ch- stocks are, are very, very cheap. You know, the... the um, the market cap of West Ham, example, is a couple of million dollars. Well, you know, we've, we've probably got four or 500,000 ounces in reserves of, of low grade there, you know. So that's what I think will happen, and I can't wait. All right, well, Gren, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure. Always happy to talk to uh, people who have been around in the industry and have great success under their wings. And uh, I hope to, to get you or your daughter even back on, uh, on the show here to talk to our listeners in the near future. Great. Well, Carl, it's a pleasure talking to you, and um, the best of luck with your, with your program, too. 
think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bit. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen? Are you too stupid? 